Given two points, A and B, what is the shape of the path between them that will take the least time for a ball to traverse, but gravity is the only force acting on it? You might think that the answer is a straight line, since it's the shortest path. But starting out with a slope helps the ball speed up while making the path longer. So where do you find the balance between shortness and steepness? Johann Bernoulli asked this problem in the Acta Auditorium, a mathematical publication in 1696, addressing it to some of the greatest mathematicians of his time. He issued the problem statement shown here, offering his peers his admiration and a chance to go down in history. Newton solved it by using calculus, but that's not the solution I'll be discussing. Bernoulli's solution made a use of several important concepts in optics, like format principle, least time, and sounds off, and displays ingenuity and creative thinking. So without any further ado, let's begin with the derivation. When the ball decreases in height by an elevation h, it loses potential energy equal mass times gravitational acceleration times height. However, due to conservation of energy, you can one kind of energy equal one half times mass times velocity squared. If you rearrange the equation, you get that the velocity is proportional to the square root of the vertical distance from the start. So, what was Bernoulli's great brainwave? While he wrote for us principal least time, he said that it always takes the shortest path to get to another point. The path that it takes would be the rookies to prone. So, how would you model the changing velocity? Well, the speed of the light depends on the refractive index of the medium. Bernoulli realized if it had glass with many layers, each with a different refractive index, then you could model the situation of light, with velocity increasing the further down you go in the medium. Like so. Another thing we know about light is that it's always instantaneously being Snell's law. That is, the product of the sign of the angle of the normal and the refractive index is constant. We can use this property to find a relationship between the angle of the tangent line through the cone and the vertical distance traveled. So we know this equation is the tangent line, the derivative of whatever function represents the Bernoulli's term. When Bernoulli saw it, he immediately recognized it as the derivative of a cycloid. But what exactly is a cycloid? Well, to put it simply, a cycloid is a curve traced out by a point on a wheel as the wheel rolls along a flat, frictionless surface, like in the animation. This might seem kind of surprising, so I'll also prove why this holds true. The point O acts as the instantaneous center of rotation for point P, like it's on a pendulum with tighter point O. As a result, the circle with center O with P on the circumference shares the vertices of its tangent. Before OP is perpendicular to the tangent line, and see a right angle of the circle, this would be a diameter. Now comes the trig. If we take the diameter to be D, we can see that OP is D sine theta. Since the diameter makes a right angle to the surface, we also have a pair of similar triangles. Applying trig again, we get that this length, the distance from the top, is D sine theta squared. The distance that we called H before is D sine theta squared. If we rearrange the equation, we get that 1 by root D equals sine theta by root H. Since the diameter is constant, so is sine theta by root h, which is what we've been trying to prove. The Burkistikorn problem married math and physics, and also gave birth to the calculus of variations. It also has a lot of use in roller coaster design and engineering. And finally, it proved that in reality, a straight line might not be the shortest path after all. <laughs>